St. Elsewhere was a 1982 medical television drama that was created by Joshua Brand and John Falsey. The series stars Ed Flanders, Norman Lloyd, and William Daniels as teaching doctors of an aging, rundown Boston hospital that gives interns a promising future in making critical medical and life decisions. The show was produced by Mary Tyler Moore Enterprises, which had real success with a similar NBC series that was a police drama called Hill Street Blues. Both of these shows were on at the same time, and they were constantly compared against each other because of their ensemble cast and overlapping serialized storylines. St. Elsewhere was often called Hill Street Blues in a Hospital. It was known as a gritty, realistic drama, but it wasn't terribly popular. It did gain a small, loyal following, but the series never ranked higher than 47th in the Nielsen ratings over the entire six-season run. The show found a strong audience in the Nielsen's 18-45 to age demographic, a demographic that was known for young, affluent audiences that TV advertisers just loved, and they did everything they could to reach them. That's what kept this show on the air. It surely wasn't its ratings. But the truth be known, this was a very well-done show. The writing, the acting, the directing were all top-notch. It's listed as one of the top 50 greatest shows of all time. St. Elsewhere was set in the fictional St. Allegis Hospital a decaying urban teaching hospital on Boston's south end. The facade for the hospital is the Franklin House on East Newton Street in Boston. That building provides affordable apartments for residents living in the south end of Boston. From the early 1900s to the 1970s, the building was the Franklin Square Hotel for Women. It provided apartments for young women in Boston. For a few months after she graduated from Boston University in the early 1960s, Faye Dunaway was a resident there. The hospital's nickname of St. Elsewhere is a slang term that's used in the medical field to refer to a lesser-equipped hospital that serves patients turned away by more prestigious institutions. It's also more used in medical academia to refer to teaching hospitals in general. In the pilot episode of the show, surgeon Mark Craig, played by William Daniels, informs his colleagues that the local Boston media has bestowed this derogatory nickname on St. Allegis since they are perceived as a hospital That's nothing more than a dumping ground, a place you wouldn't want to send your mother-in-law. As a matter of fact, the hospital was so poorly regarded that its shrine, St. Allegis, was commonly defiled by the hospital's visitors and staff. Along with the established actors of Ed Flanders, Norman Lloyd, and William Daniels, the show has an ensemble cast that never quits. These are names that go on to be big Hollywood stars. People like David Morse, Bruce Greenwood, Christina Pickles, Ed Bagley Jr., Stephen First, Howie Mandel, Mark Harmon, Denzel Washington, and Helen Hunt. Actor William Daniels said that he was offered the part of Dr. Craig, and at that time, He was given not only the pilot script to read, but he was given the first three scripts to read. He said the producers did this to show that his character was prominent in some episodes, but not in others. This gave him the sense that this was a real ensemble cast and was the true nature of the show. But Daniels went on to appear in almost every single episode for the entire series. He only missed eight episodes out of 129. Ed Bagley Jr. came in second place, appearing in all but 11 episodes. 
William Daniels also had another part-time job while he was portraying Mark Craig. Now, this part-time job was a pretty popular one, and it made his voice well-known. He recorded the lines for Kit in Knight Rider. He did all this on his days off from St. Elsewhere. Knight Rider and St. Elsewhere both aired on NBC from 1982 to 1986. In one episode, Dr. Axelrod and P.A. Luther Hawkins are trying to cheer up Dr. Ficus, who has been shot. Among the things they perform to do that is blowing up a rubber surgical glove and then putting it over their heads to no avail, prompting Axelrod, played by Stephen First, to make a comment about the guy on TV who got a big laugh from doing this on the small screen. That person was Howie Mandel, who played Dr. Ficus. Norman Lloyd got one of the lead roles as Dr. Daniel Auslander because he was a lifelong friend of Bruce Paltrow's family. Bruce Paltrow was the executive producer of the show, and Norman Lloyd was supposed to guest star in only four episodes, but somehow he really connected with the show, and the response from audiences was great, and he just stayed on until the show's conclusion. Friends and family members of the cast and crew often provided the names of the doctors that were paged over the PA system. It's kind of fun to listen for those pages. In several episodes, you hear Dr. Gwyneth Paltrow being paged. She's the famous actress nowadays, and her father is Bruce Paltrow. The writers of this show shared the same building and copy machine that the Mary Tyler Moore writers for Hill Street Blues did. Whenever they needed inspiration for this show, they would look at some scripts from Hill Street Blues. That always pushed them to do better. The last episode is full of inside jokes. I just love it when things like this happen in a series or a movie, but it's especially fun in a series. Included in these fun jokes are a doctor named Brandon Falsey, which is a reference to Brand and Falsey, the creators of the show. There was also a chase of a one-armed man, which was a reference to the fugitive. During that chase, someone yells, Move the gurney, Hal! This was a reference to Hal Gurney, Dave Letterman's director. When the show was to be canceled after its sixth season, Show writer Tom Fontana pitched several ideas for the ending of the series. One of them had two doctors in conversation when they are suddenly interrupted by a nearby nuclear explosion that supposedly kills everyone. Another idea had one doctor confessing that he was the second gunman during the JFK assassination. He then goes on to pull a gun on his colleague. Executive producer Bruce Paltrow didn't like either of these ideas, but he was receptive to the suggestion of the snow globe ending, which implies that the entire series occurred inside the fantasy of an autistic boy's mind. This was truly an unexpected choice for the series' end, and half of the viewers accepted this ending, while the other half absolutely hated it. Ed Flanders struggled with his drinking problems his entire life, and especially during this popular show. His actions with his co-stars were deemed unprofessional strictly because of his drinking, and they led to him being fired from the show. He did come back for the first two episodes of the final season and for the season finale. But in my opinion, he is one of the strongest characters in the entire show. He makes St. Elsewhere be a sanctuary for the underdog and the downtrodden. After the show ended in 1988, he was a crippled man, and alcohol became a daily part of his life. In his last years, Ed became a recluse on his 190-acre ranch in the tiny hamlet of Denny, in Northern California. He made a daily 30-mile trip to Willow Creek 
the closest large town that had a post office where he would pick up his mail and he would frequent the local bars. He would always sit in the same place on the same bar stool near the doors. He was a very lonely man. While at home, he would rarely leave his sofa. On the morning of February 22, 1995, he took out his 30 6 rifle and positioned the barrel against his right temple. He was only 60 years old. Ed was a brilliant talent that we lost way too soon. He's fondly remembered when you watch St. Elsewhere in reruns today. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.